Good Tuesday, everyone, and happy first day of spring. Of course, you wouldn't know it if you lived in the Northeast. They just got slammed with three nor'easters, and the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast are going to experience another winter storm over the next couple of days. Winter certainly is hanging on for all it's worth. Anyway, my name is Ty, and this is episode 34 of the Southern Conservative Podcast. Just a reminder, there will not be a podcast on Thursday this week, and I have yet to decide whether there will be a makeup podcast on Friday, so stay tuned for that. Yesterday, I summarized Andrew McCabe's recent firing and the lack of integrity this man has when it comes to the Hillary Clinton email investigation and Trump-Russia collusion. I want to delve into McCabe some more today. There's been conflicting reports as to whether McCabe is going to receive his government pension now that he has been fired. McCabe has access to any money in his pension during his time at the FBI, but now the government will not be further contributing to his pension because of his firing. But McCabe should be indicted right now, not just simply fired from the FBI. So McCabe was fired for making unauthorized disclosures to the media and for lying to investigators about those leaks. And apparently McCabe has lied to investigators on multiple occasions. An interesting point has been raised. If Michael Flynn can be charged with making false statements to the FBI, why hasn't McCabe been charged with lying under oath? Reports indicate that charges may be coming in the future. But folks, this just further makes the case for why a second special counsel is needed to investigate top officials within the FBI and DOJ as it relates to abuse of power. McCabe certainly needs to be investigated. So does James Comey. <clears throat> so does James Comey, who was the former director of the FBI and Andrew McCabe's boss. Now, aside from the fact that Comey exonerated Hillary Clinton through the help of Peter Strzok and others, to rewrite his conclusion of that investigation before Clinton and others were investigated, aside from the fact he told Trump he was not under investigation when the FBI had gone to the FISA court to seek warrants to spy on Carter Page, and in turn everyone he was in communication with, including members of the Trump campaign and transition team. It appears Comey has been caught in a lie. You see, Comey testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee in May 2017, and he was asked by Chairman Chuck Grassley, Have you ever been an anonymous source in news reports about matters relating to the Trump investigation or the Clinton investigation? And he responded, Never. Have you ever authorized someone else at the FBI to be an anonymous source in news reports about the Trump investigation or the Clinton investigation? And he said no. So that's Comey's version. Now remember, Clinton was not only investigated for her emails, but the Clinton Foundation was being investigated by the FBI. And in fact, it is still being investigated by the FBI field office in Little Rock, Arkansas. Andrew McCabe, in a statement he put out after his finding, had this to say. The OIG, that's Office of Inspector General, Investigation has focused on information I chose to share with a reporter through my public affairs officer and the legal counselor. As deputy director, I was one of only a few people who had the authority to do that. It was not a secret. It took place over several days, and others, including the director, were aware of the interaction with the reporter. So McCabe is saying James Comey was aware of the interaction he was having with a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Remember, this Wall Street Journal article was published in November 2016, six months before Comey's testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. So someone here has to be lying. It's either McCabe or it's Comey. So getting back to the point I was making about a second special counsel, the evidence is now overwhelming that top FBI and DOJ officials saw to it that Hillary Clinton not be indicted so she could continue to run for president. And we see a very well-coordinated effort between the FBI and DOJ officials, some of the same people involved in the Clinton investigation, to see to it that Trump not get elected and then to try to take down his presidency. 
and top officials in the intelligence community were involved in spreading the salacious dossier to the media and lawmakers in order to make the dossier a national sensation meant to bring down Donald Trump. John Brennan, the former CIA director, was all over Capitol Hill leaking the dossier information to lawmakers, including Harry Reid, who at the time was the top Democrat in the Senate. Then you have James Clapper, former director of national intelligence, who leaked the dossier to CNN. Every single one of these guys is supposed to be neutral and apolitical, and clearly they were biased. They favored Hillary Clinton, despite her obvious illegal behavior concerning how she handled classified information, and they despised Donald Trump. But now that Trump is president and Republicans control the Congress, all of this is being investigated. But it needs to go further. We need a special counsel that can actually bring charges to those who committed crimes. And the crimes here are indeed numerous. What's more disturbing are recent tweets that have been made by some of these men. Let's first look at John Brennan, who recently tweeted in regards to President Trump, When the full extent of your venality, moral turpitude, and political corruption becomes known, you will take your rightful place as a disgraced demagogue in the dustman of history. You may scapegoat Andy McCabe, but you will not destroy America. America will triumph over you. What in the hell is that all about? First, why was Brennan spreading the dossier all over Capitol Hill to Democratic lawmakers? Where's his moral turpitude? And talk about political corruption. The dossier is absolutely filled with unverified information that turned out to be nothing more than Russian propaganda and lies fed to Christopher Steele by Russians. And even Steele suggested recently he's skeptical as to whether Trump had hookers urinate on a bed at a hotel in Moscow in 2013. And Andrew McCabe is not a scapegoat. The Office of Personal Responsibility within the DOJ clearly believed McCabe needed to be fired and made that recommendation to Jeff Sessions. Trump is not involved in this decision in any way. Then you have James Comey, who is so full of himself and so arrogant, it's unreal. And just think, before the exoneration of Hillary Clinton, everyone was saying how much of a straight shooter this guy was. Well, so much for that. Anyway, Comey recently tweeted, Mr. President, the American people will hear my story very soon and they can judge for themselves who is honorable and who is not. Well, Mr. Comey, we already have evidence and facts as to how honorable you are, and to tell the truth, you are very dishonorable. The way you fixed the Clinton email investigation, the way you went after Trump's campaign by going to the FISA court, and then later telling Trump the dossier, which the bulk of the FISA applications were based on, was salacious and unverified. Well, at least you told the truth to the president then. Then you testified before Congress that you told Trump he wasn't under investigation. And you had memos of the president leaked to the New York Times after you gave them to a Columbia law professor. And apparently, according to McCabe, you knew he was disclosing information to the Wall Street Journal in 2016 after an investigation related to the Clinton Foundation. You tell me who's honorable and who's not. But Comey's going around the liberal media circuit touting his book. It's just incredible. Speaking of memos, apparently McCabe has memos on Trump. What are all these people doing with memos of the president? And why is McCabe giving these memos to Robert Mueller? To me, it's just more evidence that McCabe has it out for Donald Trump. We know he was in communication with Lisa Page and Peter Strzok about setting up an insurance policy to prevent Trump from becoming president and then to take down his presidency. It is clear McCabe had it out for the president then, and he clearly has it out for him now. The bias is crystal clear. The bottom line in all of this, it's a good thing McCabe was fired. This is one big step toward draining the swamp and getting rid of the politicization within the FBI and Justice Department. One more point before we wrap this up. McCabe has supposedly said he isn't going to be the only one to fall for this. If he's going down, he's taking everybody else with him. And that's the thing about being the first one to fall. You can rat out everyone else. It's possible this whole thing could unravel very quickly. 
I want to remind everyone to please check out my Facebook page. Go to facebook.com slash southernconservative. That's facebook.com slash southernconservative. There you will find links to conservative news articles on stories you may not hear about in the mainstream media. Plus, if you follow the news feed, you'll find links to the daily podcast. Be sure to also subscribe to this YouTube channel. You'll be notified each time a podcast has been posted. Podcasts are posted daily, Monday through Thursday. I want to read an article to you from the Washington Examiner. It's a summary of some of the corruption within the Obama administration that has been detailed in a new book by Peter Schweitzer called Secret Empires, How Our Politicians Hide Corruption and Enrich Their Families and Friends. President Obama used his executive powers to attack industries to lower the value of certain companies, allowing his friends in the private sector to swoop in and buy them up at reduced prices. Obama and his administration would deem industries either destructive to the environment or exploitative for the financial and professional gain of his friends, including industries such as coal mining, offshore drilling, cash advance companies, and for-profit colleges. So folks, not only was Obama attacking these companies in the private sector because of his liberal progressive philosophy, but he did so in order to enrich his buddies. A win for Obama and a win for his pals. The book highlighted Marty Nesbitt and Harold Kirkpatrick III, both former basketball players and close friends of the Obamas, who launched their private equity investment firm, Vistria, in sync with Obama's re-election in 2012. Unlike other investment funds that avoid highly regulated industries, Vistria was specifically focused on the fields that Obama was busy regulating. A curious pattern began to emerge, Schweitzer said in his book. Obama and his administration would attack industries with government power, which led to substantially lower valuations for these companies. Nesbitt and Vistria, or others close to Obama, could then acquire those assets for pennies on the dollar. The book said one of the most visible targets of this scheme was the for-profit higher education industry. Obama concluded in 2013 that for-profit schools such as University of Phoenix, ITT Technical Institute, and DeVry University victimized students. They've been preyed upon very badly by some of these for-profit institutions, Obama said in 2013 about students who attended these schools. Their credit is ruined and the for-profit institution is making out like a bandit. The University of Phoenix was hit hard by Obama's action when he ordered the Federal Trade Commission, among other government agencies, to crack down on for-profit schools. After being suspended in 2015 following an investigation by the FTC, Phoenix's parent company, Apollo Education Group, was bought out by three companies in 2016, including Vistria, for nine times less than its value before the suspension. Schweitzer's book also said there were close links between Vistria and the Department of Education, and some department officials later went on to work for the investment firm. For example, Deputy Secretary of Education Tony Miller left the department in 2013 to join Vistria, and Deputy Assistant to Obama for Legislative Affairs John Samuels was also an early hire at the investment firm. Department meetings in which for-profit schools were discussed included people who now work with Vistria. Miller participated in those meetings, and so did Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, who would also end up working for the company. Schweitzer described emails that he said show department officials were talking to Wall Street investors and leaking information about regulations. Isn't it fascinating, folks? You know, the government is supposed to work for the people, And it does that by getting out of the way and letting the private sector thrive and allow people to be innovative. And I'm sure you've wondered how people get into politics, whether it's in the administrative state or in Congress, and they come out filthy rich. Well, it's easy to do when you hold the power. You regulate this industry that you don't like. You don't enforce the law here. You make deals under the table. You pass a law to benefit this industry that you're involved in outside of Congress. And there you go, on your way to making millions. And that's what happens. I've always found it fascinating how the Clintons enriched themselves. During the 2016 election, it was reported that Clintons were worth $150 million. 
We know they were paid lucrative sums of money for speaking engagements. But to the tune of $150 million? That's insane. There had to be something else. It certainly didn't happen from their jobs in public service. Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas and president of the United States. Hillary worked at the Rose Law Firm, was first lady of Arkansas and first lady of the United States, then senator from New York, then secretary of state. So how are they worth $150 million? They're enriching themselves from the Clinton Foundation. And the foundation is under investigation today by the FBI. One of the more interesting donations made to the foundation occurred around the time of the Uranium One deal being approved. And Hillary was one of the members of the board who signed off on that deal. The corruption in politics is fascinating, and it happens under the radar on a daily basis, folks. Well, that does it for today. Be sure to check back for another podcast tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody.